Oh, thank you. Hey, the Orford, the Orfordville crew made it up here. Good work. Front row. That's encouraging. It's funny, um, you know, we went snowboarding on Friday night, and then I was talking to my wife about it, and she was like, so who all went? And I was explaining, you know, the, some of the Morrises went, and some. And I was going through the list, and then I got to the Orfordville crew, and I was like, and Reuben went, and um, Svenja went, and Lakin, and Storm, and I was like, I feel like I was on the X-Men, you know, like, because you guys have such cool names, and um, I don't know, it was just, it was just fun. Um, but hey, we're doing this series right now, and we're in the Ten Commandments, so we're, we're just kind of marching our way through these different commandments and listening to what God has to say and constantly reminding ourselves of the context of grace in which he delivers them. You know, he, he rescues his people, and he, um, you know, he, he says, I'm the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and then, then he gives us these different words. And so um, we want to we want to hear what he has to say in that context, recognizing that the law comes to us in the in the um, context of grace. And so we've kind of marched our way through it. And today we are in the fifth commandment, and that's in verse 12 of chapter 20 in the book of Exodus. So turn with me there, please. Exodus chapter 20, and we're we're going to look at verse 12 and uh, talk about what that means. So I'm going to read it, and then we'll pray for help, and then we'll jump right in. This is Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word, for your ten different words of instruction, your ten different words of grace, God. Thank you that you have given us, uh, in these ten commandments, a covenant for life with you. And uh, God, I pray for ears to hear tonight, that we would listen to what you have to say to us and that we would respond with obedience, God, uh, knowing that our relationship with you is, is firm, it's secure, it's in Christ. And we're not trying to earn um, a relationship with you. We have one. You're the Lord our God who rescues us from slavery. But God, we want, as a result of that salvation, to go back to your law and to respond uh, to the grace you've given us in the appropriate way of, of obedience of faith. And so God, help us to do that, please, in your name. Amen. So, I mean, obviously this is going to, this one, out of all the different commandments, this one is probably the most specific and the most, when I think about student ministry, I think this is so important. And you might not like me after this, but, but here's the deal. I can't, I can't help it, right? As we go through, here's some different commandments, and we get to commandment number five. I'm not going to go, well, let's just skip over this one, you know? This is God speaking, and we want to hear him, and we want to be willing to do what he's telling us to do. And uh, what's interesting, if you're looking at the, the Ten Commandments, there's different ways to divide it up. Right? Uh, like, think with me for a minute. When Jesus himself was uh, asked the question, Hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? You know, what, what should we be all about? And can you think about how he answered it? He answered it really in, in a couple different ways in Matthew 22. He says, here's, here's what it is. Do so you want to know about the Ten Commandments? You want to know about the law of God? You want to know how you can divide it up? He says, here's the essence of it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it, he goes on to say, is love your neighbor as yourself. And so he divides the law into two different categories. A, a vertical one and a horizontal one. Vertical being, you know, your responsibility to God. So if you're looking at the Ten Commandments, we sometimes call it the two tables. Like, table number one would be, what's your responsibility to God himself? And so we look at the first four commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol to worship. Uh, you shall um, honor his name by not misusing it. You should rest. And all these, you know, all those different commandments that have to do with our relationship to God himself. And then the second table is really kind of what Jesus said, the second commandment is, is like it. It's this, love your neighbor as yourself. It's that horizontal, like your responsibility to the people you're going to see at school and your responsibility to the people that you work for and all these different things uh, will play out in that second table. But he divides it that way, right? Responsibility to God, responsibility to other people. Does that make sense? Is that clear for you guys? Is that helpful? Um, but here's what's interesting. If you look at the fifth commandment, it's right there in the middle. You know, it's right there, uh, just kind of in between those two different tables of the law. 
And in fact, there was debate, you know, about, you know, whether or not it should be on the first table. And here's why. Because people have always known and recognized that a parent stands in the position of God to their child. And in fact, uh, a philosopher, a real ancient philosopher named Philo said it this way, parents stand by their nature on the borderline between the mortal and the immortal because the act of generation assimilates them to God, the generator of all. You know, you, you make a child, you're being like God who is the maker of everything. And he's saying, so you as a parent stand in relationship to that t- child like God. I was hanging out with my buddies on Saturday night. We were playing video games and doing stupid things that, that we do, you know, uh, my high school buddies. But they were asking me some different questions because I haven't seen them in months and months and months and asking what it's like to be a dad. And I was talking to one of the guys and I was like, it's kind of crazy. You know, it's like a really heavy deal because I'm responsible for a human being. You know, you think about that. Like, I'm responsible. If I don't feed her, who's going to? Right? So, so I understand this idea that as a parent, I have an obligation to help my daughter, to provide for her. More important than, you know, more important is just like, I need, she's going to learn her worldview from me. And so I need to teach her about the things of God and I need to help her to know um, who God is and what he's like and, and her worldview is going to be shaped and formed because of interactions with, with me and Ash. And so it's a, it's a pretty heavy deal. But this is saying your, your parent, your parents, they stand in relationship to you like they are God. And so it's telling us uh, that we need to take that very seriously. So what does it mean? to follow the fifth commandment. What does it mean to honor your father and your mother? What does that look like? And so uh, I just began to think about that this week and started to try to come up with some different answers. The first thing I would say is honor is more comprehensive than obedience. It's a bigger category than obey. The commandment doesn't say obey your father and your mother. It says honor them. And here's why. You can obey mom or dad without honoring them. Right? They give you a task, a chore, uh, do the dishes. You get home from youth group tonight, they're like, here's what you need to do. You need to take out the trash. And you could do that task obediently, right? Grab the trash, take it out, put it where it needs to be. But you could do that in a very dishonoring way, right? Like, oh, I can't believe that they would ask me to do this. I just got done with youth group. It was a long, long day. You can do that with, with dishonor. So the commandment is bigger than just obedience. It is this heart motivation of I respect, I, I honor, I listen to you, all this different stuff. It really comes down to the heart. And so this one is a hard commandment to be faithful with because it's telling us that we need to honor our parents. When we talk about what honor means, Calvin broke it down into three different things. He said it's reverence and submission and gratitude reverence is having to do with respect, you know, that you would treat your parents with, um, you know, with a level of respect because of who they are. And, um, and I just wrote down a couple different notes on here. It's listening to their requests with patience. You know, when, you're, when your parents are talking to you, do you listen to them with a patient and gentle spirit, trying to hear what it is that they're saying? Are you already writing off everything that's coming out of their mouths, right? It's listening to them with respect and patience. It's treating them with dignity. You know, treating them with the honor that's due to them because of their position as parent over you. And treating them with dignity. Avoiding hateful language. I mean, I I don't know why, but I just remember being younger and being able to say things like, I hate you, right? Just like a punk kid, like, I hate you. You're ruining my life, right? And that's what kids say. But that is dishonoring to a parent, obviously. And it's saying that we need to avoid that sort of language. Um, It's guarding their reputation. You know, it's not gossiping about them or slandering them behind their back or talking to other people about how awful your parents are or going on Facebook or social media and venting that way. You know, that's, that's dishonoring to their reputation. It's honoring their station. That's what reverence really has to do with. It's this reality that God has placed you in a family under the authority of your parents or your guardians. 
That idea comes from Acts 17 where it talks about how God uh, from one man made all nations and he decided the times and the places that they would live in order that they would perhaps reach out to him and find him. So what that verse is talking about, uh, it has to do with the fact that God has decided when you were going to be born, the family you were going to be born into, and all of that. And I don't know all the purposes of God, but I can at least say this. He did that very purposefully. That he did that. He gave you your family. He gave you your situation. And, and he did that in a way that, I mean, I don't, I don't understand all of it, but I know that he does it very purposefully according to Acts 17. He determines the times and the places for us. And so we should respect our parents. We should have reverence for them. That's part of it. That's what, part of what it means to honor. Uh, second part is to submit to them. Right? Submitting is coming under the authority of another individual. And I say that, and, and I know that it is one of the most unpopular words that, that we have in our vocabulary. Submission is something that we think, that's old-fashioned. Okay, Cor, why don't you go back to 1960 and, uh, you know, you, your wife can submit to you and you can just be happy back there or whatever. And, and I need to tell you something. Submission is not something that's hard only for us. It's always been hard. Calvin writing in, in the 1500s, in 1545, he talks about how we, we hate submission because of our independence, because of our pride. We, he, you know, that long ago, that's before 1960. He's writing that long ago and he's going, yeah, we have a problem with that too. Submission isn't easy. It's not something that comes naturally. Placing yourself under the authority of another individual is not an easy deal, but it is what we're called to do. And we're called to do it uh, as children under our parents and also in other contexts as well. And so we need to come under the authority of those um, different people. Um, and I was thinking about this. When you submit, you're acting like God. God submits. Like, think about Jesus. When he was in the garden and he was praying right before he was crucified, he was saying, let this cup pass from me. Meaning, I don't want to go through this experience. My will is that this would change. That there, was an, that there would be another way. But then he, he adds this qualifier on his prayer. But not my will be done, yours. And so he submits to the Father. And he, he prays that way. He says, I've always come, uh, I, I always do what my Father wants me to do. He submits. The Holy Spirit submits. And the whole, they, they gladly do it, right? The Holy Spirit isn't walking around like, man, I got the crummiest job out of all three of us. Like, I have to glorify the Son and the Father and nobody even, you know, knows about me, right? When people write books, I'm the forgotten God. Like, oh, glum. You know, it's, that's not how it works. There's glad submission in the Trinity. There's glad submission in the Trinity. And so God is calling us to kind of be like him in this regard, to submit. And that's part of being a child, is coming under the authority and leadership of the parent to which God has placed you under. So submission is part of it. Obedience, I think, stems from that. Obedience is, is a willingness to do what is being requested of you. And I'm not saying it's a blind obedience. I'm not saying whenever somebody tells you to do something, you just do it without thinking. There are going to be circumstances where you, in good conscience, have to disobey a parent. Um, the apostles understood this. They stood on trial and uh, they were told not to do something by an authority and they said, we have to obey God and not man. And that's in Acts chapter 5. And there are going to be times where you have to say that. Where your parent's going to want you to do something and it's going to be in conflict with the will of God and you're going to have to choose, I choose God. Um, Jesus said, you know, I came not to bring peace but, but division, even within families. And there are going to be times where you have to set your allegiance with him. But the majority of the time, according to, I think, this passage is God's will for you is that you would submit to your parents, that you would honor your parents, that you would obey your parents. I mean, that's what this commandment is about. It's about us honoring our parents. So that's God's will. And so I don't like when, when uh, students will come to me and, and use God as an excuse for disobedience. Like, like the parent and this, this, the will of the student and the will of God are in conflict, and so they, they use God as an excuse. What I'm saying is, more often than not, what God's will is going to be is that you would submit and obey 
to your parents. Does that make sense? So obedience is part of it. We don't do it blindly, um, but, but we should be willing to offer obedience in a way that's unreluctant. And even when we disagree or have to choose otherwise, we should do that in a very honoring way. So that's part of it as well. And then the third thing is gratitude. Gratitude being gratefulness for the parent that you have, the set of parents that you have, uh, the authority that's over you, gratefulness for um, all the things that they do, and, and even expressing that in different ways. Like, um, the way that it's talked about in the scriptures is, even as our parents get older, we still have a responsibility to care for them. And in fact, we need to start thinking, and especially us leaders that are a little bit older, we need to start thinking about how are we setting ourselves up to continue to provide for our parents. Because when Jesus was, was teaching on this commandment, he looked at the Pharisees and he got so mad at them because they, they took their resources and they declared them Corbin. Resources that were supposed to go to helping their parents, they said, I am dedicating this to God very conveniently. And Jesus goes, that's sinfulness. That's breaking the fifth commandment. You're taking resources that you should care for a parent with and you're declaring them, these belong to God. He's going, that's sin. That's sin. You're, you're using your tradition and putting it in the place of what God has said. Um, but he, he, Jesus himself, he even obeys this, this idea when he's on the cross. If you guys remember this, he, he cares for his mom in those last moments by, by assigning responsibility to one of the apostles to, to care for her, to look after her. And, and that's part of gratitude. Being grateful is showing and expressing that gratefulness to mom and dad. This commandment has a reward tied to it. Um, it says in verse 12, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. There's a principle here of obedience to this commandment leads to thriving and prosperity and long life. And I know it's a general principle. It doesn't work like every kid that's obedient lives to 120 and is very happy. I mean, it's a general principle, but as a whole, if you look at a society where um, kids are obedient to their parents and respectful and honoring, it, it results in, in long life and prosperity. And that's very true. But if, if that's true, then the opposite is also true, meaning if you break this commandment, it doesn't go well for you. Um, it leads to deterioration of the family, which is deterioration of society. In fact, uh, Jerry Vines puts it this way, show me a nation where there is disobedience to parents and I'll show you a nation whose foundations are crumbling. When, when you set a course of being dishonoring to parents, you are setting a course for a disaster. The, the foundations of, of a nation are crumbling under your feet. Um, when Paul is writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he's talking about the last days and how awful they'll be and what it's going to look like to live in this sort of society. And he says, mark this, there will be terrible times in the, in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And he's, he's describing what it's going to be like in these awful days, but part of that built in is they're disobedient to their parents. They break the fifth commandment. They dishonor mom and dad and they do it consistently. We're living in a time where we're there, right? Society is there. Family units are broken, they're jacked up, they're messed up, and, and part of it stems from a misunderstanding here of what we're called to do in the fifth commandment. Al Mohler says, we live in an age of intentional orphans. Meaning there's a lot of people who have parents, but they choose to treat them as if they don't. An age of intentional orphans. Having a parent, but being dishonoring towards them, and so disregarding them. That's where we're at. I was here last night and, and a lady came in and needed prayer and she was talking about a bunch of different things but she told a story about her granddaughter uh, and her daughter and her granddaughter had a... Uh, the mom, okay, the mom and the daughter. The mom has a bottle of water and she finishes it up and she says, hey, can you throw this away? Throw it in the trash, please. 
And the daughter takes it and throws it in her face and says, I just did. And that is, you know, that is where we're at. We're in a situation where dishonoring a parent is ordinary. I mean, I tell you that story and you gasp a little bit, but at the same time, can't you see that happening? Like It, do, I, it doesn't sound fictitious. It's not a made-up story. It's a real one. And that's where we're at. We're in a situation where dishonoring parents is the norm. And I'm, I'm encouraging you guys to try to break that norm, that we would try to be the people who would get out of this cycle of destruction. Our, our families are broken. Marriages are falling apart. Um, there's all sorts of issues. There's homelessness here in our own town. And, and uh, there's all sorts of different problems stemming from the brokenness within families. And, and people will talk to me and be like, you know, do you think that youth ministry is legitimate? Shouldn't we get guys to be leaders of their homes and write this thing and get things going and repair marriages and repair families and all of that? And I'm like, yeah, amen to that. Where's it going to start? Where are you going to find those dudes? Because I've got a bunch of them. And so here's my plan. I want to encourage you guys to take ownership and take leadership in this and honor your parents. And that will situate us to uh, be better dads and be better husbands and be better men in society. And, and so that's what I'm, that's what I'm all about. I, I want to see this thing fixed and I believe that it can start right here when we take ownership of what God is calling us to do. We can't play the victim card. Well, my parents are awful and they've done all this wrong. Okay, but your responsibility is to honor them. I'm not saying obey them. I'm not saying, you know, jump at everything that they ever tell you to do. I'm saying honor them. That's what God is calling us to do. And I think by, by the grace of God, we can do it. One of the hardest things of my job, uh, being a youth pastor, is to translate the stories you guys tell me. Okay? You tell me about your parents. And they sound like monsters. And then I have to go, wait a second, hold on. And I ask more questions, and then I try to get to know your parents as well. And, um... And, I, you know, are they really monsters or are they God-given authorities, you know? And I'm trying to sort through all of this, and sometimes they are monsters, I'll admit there. But, but um, here's, here's my concern. When you demonize your parents, breaking the fifth commandment and making them out to be monsters, it's actually you who are becoming the monsters. That's what St. Augustine said. He, he put it this way. If anyone fails to honor his parents, is there anyone he will spare? If you can't honor mom and dad who care for you and love you uh, and provide for you, is there anybody in all of society off limits? We become monsters when we start this habit of breaking the fifth commandment and treating with contempt the people who, who care for us and love us. And so we need to repent and get back on track and, and love our parents and honor them. And so I would say it this way, when the family unit is protected and, and when it is cherished and when it is encouraged, there is reward. When we begin this, and we've got to take ownership for ourselves, when we begin this pattern of, of, of honoring our parents, there's a reward, long life in the, in the land that the Lord is giving you. And that's what I want to experience. Let me give you a couple different reasons why this is so practical. Number one, this commandment, shows you your desperate need of the gospel. Doesn't it? The, I mean, this week, as I was praying and studying and preparing to preach, I was like, oh my goodness, this is devastating. Like, I'm looking at these different texts, and I'm, out of all the other ones, I'm just going, I, I can't do this. Right? And I don't know if you feel that, that same tension, but this is revealing your desperate need for saving. That if you're like me, you're a rebel. And you don't like to submit, and, and you, would rather, you would rather be God than have to submit to God. You would rather forge your own way than have to come under the authority of anybody else. And so I'm looking at this, and I'm going, God, I need your rescue. I need your help. Um, and so it's very practical, because it shows us our need of the grace of God and the rescue of God. Number two, it gives expression to our faith. It, it, it's an opportunity for us to show what we really believe. Right? We could talk all day long. I believe in God. I want to follow God and all of that. And then he goes, okay, we'll go home tonight. Let's see it. It gives expression to our faith because it becomes the environment where we demonstrate our obedience. God is saying, I've given you parents 
and you're saying that you're going to follow me, here's what it looks like. Here's the fifth commandment. Honor them. And so, you know, it becomes a training ground for us to learn how to love and to forgive and to endure when there's conflict and, and how to overcome these different things. But, it, but it's very important that, that we see this as so practical. God is saying, you've got stuff to do tonight. You've got some honoring to do tonight. You've got some repentance to do tonight. And so I think it's very practical in this way. Again, Jerry Vine says, if you can't learn to get along with your family, then you're going to have a, a lot of problems getting along with anybody else in society. It's a training ground for us to learn how to relate to other people. Let me tell a story and then we'll, we'll close it out. And, uh, and I guess I, I need to set a little context to this story. The idea of honoring and what the fifth commandment is telling us to do obviously has to do with you and your parents. And so I'm, I want you guys to pursue that and, and be very uh, diligent in that regard. But it also stems over into other relationships as well. So we're supposed to honor our employers. And we're supposed to honor our teachers and coaches. And we're supposed to honor um, people, you know, in a marriage relationship. And we're supposed to, and honor just kind of goes over it, just goes over into all these different things. We're supposed to honor those who are in leadership over us in the church and those who are in government positions. And so this story is about honor between a, a king and one of his subjects. And if you guys are familiar with it, it's King David. And you can turn there if you want. I'm going to end up in 1 Samuel 20, 24. But David, I'll just kind of tell you the brief version of his story. Uh, he was a shepherd boy, right? And his, his older brothers were military people, and they were in Saul's army, and Saul was the king. So David keeps on going and checking on them. And, and eventually David gets an opportunity uh, that he capitalizes on where he fights Goliath. And he beats up on this dude, and he chops his head off. It's an awesome story. You should read it. Um, he chops his head off, and he, he's victorious, and, and uh, he gets enlisted into Saul's military. And he goes into the service of the king. And um, God continues to bless him and give him all sorts of um, just in, incredible favor in all the different campaigns that he's on. And so he's just winning fights, and he's doing all these cool things, and he's like a musician too. He can play a harp, so he's just a really rad dude. And he's doing all this different stuff, and uh, Saul starts to get jealous. They're singing songs. They're going, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands, and they sing that. And, and Saul's getting very frustrated. But Saul's the authority. He's the person in, in leadership. Well, this goes on for a long time. And, and Saul gets to a point where, you know, he's trying to trick David into marrying his daughter. And so David, you know, is very hesitant because he's so respectful of the king. And he's like, it's no small thing for me, a shepherd boy, to marry the daughter of the king. And so he's very hesitant even to do that. And he does. And that makes Saul hate him even more. And Saul's out to murder him. So David has to peace out and run for his life. And he's got a group of people and he's living in caves in the hills. And Saul keeps going out looking for David. Like sending military campaigns out. Go and find David. We need to capture him and kill him. And so David's hanging out, you know, in caves and, and just kind of living as, you know, on the run. And one time, Saul goes out with his army and they're camping there and traveling or whatever and Saul has to go to the bathroom. So he goes into a cave to relieve himself, you know, to have a little privacy. And it's the cave that David is in. So David's in the back of the cave and Saul comes walking in, you know, like can't see yet because it's still dark and he just came out, you know, came from the light and he starts to go to the bathroom and David's like, dude, that's Saul. And he sneaks up on him. And his, all of his friends are like, this is, God has just given you your enemy right into your hands. Look at this. This is crazy. And so he marches up to him. And he's, you know, he's sneaking up. And he pulls out his sword. And he cuts off the corner of his robe. And then he sneaks back. And Saul gets done and he goes out. David goes outside of the cave after Saul goes out. And he goes, my lord, the king... Okay, let me ask you this. Is Saul a good authority? No. He's trying to kill this dude. Is he good at what God has, you know, he's, God has given him this responsibility to lead this people, and he's squandering it. He's using all of his resources to try to pursue a good dude, to kill him. 
And here's what David does. He goes out and he goes, my Lord, the king. And he gets down on his knees. He bows down to him. Puts his face on the ground. And he says, God delivered you into my hands. And I cut the corner of your robe off. But here's the deal. I am not willing to lay my hand on the Lord's anointed. God has put you in a position of authority over me, so I honor you. That's 1 Samuel 24. And he keeps talking. He says, look, you've just tried to kill me and you've tried to do all these different things, but let God be the judge between you and me because here's my responsibility. You're my authority. I honor you. I honor you. And, and Saul goes, you're, you're more righteous than I am. And he goes home. Saul weeps and he you know, repents in that moment and he goes home. And, and here's the point. Here's the payload. Are you willing to honor your parents? And some of us can come up with excuses of, well, yeah, but my parents are they're awful. Are they more awful than Saul? Are they trying to kill you? Right? Because I used to say, Mom, you're ruining my life. And I, you know, one time we were doing Taekwondo and she got lunch ready or something. And so we were right in the middle of a, a sparring match, me and my, my brother Brad. And she's like, come on, dinner's ready. Come right now. And I was like, oh, you're ruining my life. And I kick a hole in the drywall because I'm so mature. <laughs> but that's what we do. We're like, you're ruining my life. But are they really? You know, are your parents really that awful? Are they as bad as Saul? And here's the deal. I would, I would challenge you. Can you honor them regardless? Find a way to do one of these. You're the Lord's anointed. And to, to give them respect. To give them obedience where it's, where it's you know, appropriate. Obviously, if they're really trying to kill you, be like David and run for your life. But at the same time, be willing to do your part Honor your father and your mother and entrust yourself to God knowing that if you're obedient to what God is telling you to do, he will care for you and watch over you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word and for how specific it is. And thank you, God, that um, this is such an important teaching, I think. I think it is just because of the reality that I mean, this is student ministry. These are a bunch of kids who are under the authority of their parents. And I just ask, Lord, that you would help us to, to really follow through on this one. That we would be humble enough to admit that we're not doing our part on the fifth commandment. That we're not honoring our parents. And that we would repent and really believe uh, the gospel. And then, you know, go and ask for forgiveness and begin to strategize to be more honoring. God, help us to do this because I think it'll glorify you and help us to do this because honestly, there's a, re there's a reward tied to it. Lord, you will use it to teach us how to be faithful. You'll use it to teach us how to one day become the kind of parents that are, that are worthy of honor, uh, that, that do the right stuff and say the right stuff and are the right stuff. But God, we know what our responsibility is, I think, because it's very clear that we need to honor. And so, Lord, help us to do that, please, in your name. Amen.